Hello and welcome to the People's Law School, sponsored by the McCracken County Bar Association. The focus for this session will be criminal law, particularly criminal defense law. I'm Carolyn Keeley and I'm joined by fellow criminal defense lawyers, Lynn Ogden, Andrew Coiner, and to my right, Emily Rourke. We all have offices locally and we practice in uh, various state and federal courts throughout the region and I'm sure some of us are pretty old so amongst the four of us we probably have about a thousand years of criminal law experience so we hope to share some of that with you today. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb here and assume that most of the folks watching are not career criminals and that you really don't have any intention of committing crimes in the near or distant future. So we thought we would focus today on uh, discussing crimes that really law-abiding citizens might accidentally find themselves committing or charged with, sort of accidental crimes, crimes that are unintentional but which nonetheless could get you in a little bit of trouble even though you're doing your best not to get in trouble. Um, and so we thought we would start with some um, uh, misdemeanor crimes. Uh, uh, misdemeanor crimes, for those who aren't aware, are crimes that carry less than 12 years uh, I'm sorry, less than 12 months in jail. Felony crimes carry more than 12 months. And I checked on, on some statistics today with the clerk's office in McCracken County and discovered that last year there were some 600 felony indictments for circuit court. Um, and juxtaposed to that, there are over 3,000 misdemeanor charges that were handled by the district court. And that's not counting DUI and traffic cases. So it's obvious that most people who come in contact with the criminal system come in contact through commission or charges for misdemeanor crimes. They're small crimes, but they can really disrupt your life and your, um, and your pocketbook as well. So I thought we'd start by talking about some of our favorite misdemeanors. Uh, but first, can somebody tell the audience how you can get charged? with a misdemeanor crime, or a felony for that matter. How can you get charged with a crime? Well, one of the things you might want to point out, Carolyn, right off the bat is to be, able to, commit a, to be able to commit a crime, you can be almost anybody, but to commit a crime, you either have to have an intentional act or intentionally mean to commit that crime or be in such a mental state that you may uh, wantonly or recklessly commit right. that crime. You can't, a, a crime is not an accident. You either have to intend to do it or take action where you would intentionally, uh, uh, where you would wantonly or recklessly do that act. So there are no uh, accidental crimes, there but there aren't. are crimes where <clears throat> you don't intend the specific result at the end of it. At the end of it, but, and when I say accidentally commit a crime, I, I mean that we didn't mean to commit a crime and we find ourselves with our, our foot in a big hole. I believe your question was, to go back to that, uh, how uh, are we charged with right. a misdemeanor? And as you said earlier, misdemeanor is a lower grade offense below a felony that carries up to a maximum of 12 months in the county jail and there's a couple of different types or categories A and B. Uh, but as to being charged, uh, most of the time uh, you're going to have to be charged with a mis misdemeanor by way of a warrant uh, issued by uh, a judge. And what you do uh, if you want to charge someone with a misdemeanor is to go to the county attorney's office you uh, fill out and sign uh, under oath a criminal complaint stating the allegations against the person uh, and then a judge will review that and determine whether or not uh, that he or she believes that there's probable cause on each element of the offense. In other words, probable cause to go ahead and issue a warrant, uh, either uh, issue a warrant for the arrest of the person or a criminal summons just telling the person to come to court if it's a pretty low grade and nonviolent type uh, alleged misdemeanor. Now there is another way to be charged with a misdemeanor and that's on the basis of the misdemeanor being committed in a police officer's presence. For instance, uh, if I uh, uh, hit someone uh, in the presence of a police officer uh, and he sees me do that, then he can charge me uh, without a warrant. Uh, but in most, uh, all instances, uh, he has to see me. Now, there are a few exceptions to that. Uh, DUI as a misdemeanor offense uh, is an exception. You don't have to see it committed as a police officer. Uh, if there's probable cause, uh, then the police officer can arrest. Another exception, shoplifting. Uh, just on probable cause, the police officer may arrest. And the difference between probable cause and actually seeing is that 
the police, when the police officer sees the offense committed, uh, he is a witness to all of the elements of the offense, whereas probable cause, he gets information usually from another source or sources, for instance, on shoplifting from store security or a person working in a store who has witnessed the shoplifting and relates the information to the officer. But the vast majority of misdemeanors, and if you visit <coughs> the county attorney's office at certain days of the week, um, are brought by citizens who walk in the office, interview with someone, take the charge. Andy, are you aware of whether there's any investigation for these allegations? Sometimes there is, Carolyn, and sometimes there isn't. I think our, our McCracken County attorney has recently passed a policy where he requires a police investigation of every private citizen complaint. But if there is uh, overwhelming evidence, the county attorney sometimes uses will use a picture of an assault and an assault case of bruises and the like. Uh, sometimes uh, there often isn't a uh, follow-up investigation. It's just the person, the complaining person's sworn word uh, against the person that comes in. So if uh, uh, Emily says, Carolyn, I really hate you and I'm going to kill you one day, uh, I can walk down to the office and have her arrested? Uh, uh, as unbelievable as it may sound, yes. And I'm sure Emily would never say that to you. I might, <laughs> Lynn might, but Emily never would. I think that's why so many people get frustrated when they get, they'll get a summons like uh, Lynn was talking about where you're just summoned to come to court or they may get arrested and actually get a warrant because they're just so surprised sometimes they may threaten someone in the heat of the moment uh, maybe a boyfriend girlfriend situation or uh, there may be a situation uh, where uh, there's a ex-husband and a uh, fighting w with a with a you know in that type of situation and then one party will go down to the county attorney's office swear out a complaint like Andy was talking about and the other party doesn't have any idea it's happening because you know they haven't been interviewed to give their side of the story but then they're arrested on it and so it does happen like like you're talking about uh, the defendant the, the person who's being arrested hasn't actually been interviewed by the police hasn't given their side of the story but they're actually having to maybe post a bond to get out of jail uh, because they've made this threat say, threatened to kill you a lot of times of course they don't mean it it's the heat of the moment heat of the situation but they've actually committed a crime there well, let me give a positive side, if I might, to what sounds pretty uh, horrible and negative. In other words, that, you know, just somebody can go down and say, you did such and such, and suddenly there's an arrest warrant uh, and they're thrown in jail. Uh, the uh, county attorney's office uh, does act a little bit as a screening uh, mechanism for these complaints. Uh, say, for instance, somebody goes to the county attorney's office and uh, another person owes them money. There may be a dispute, uh, say for instance, between a homeowner and a contractor who did some work for that homeowner. Uh, it could be a civil matter where the, there should be a complaint filed civilly for money damages in a court of law uh, and there shouldn't be a criminal warrant. And I think oftentimes, hopefully, the county attorney's office through the assistance as well as Mr. Uh, Dan Bowes will try to uh, look into these situations a little bit and perhaps tell the person that uh, is the complaining witness really think this is a civil matter and that uh, you ought to go to civil court as opposed to proceed through the criminal courts. I, I don't personally know how well the cases are screened, but it's my hope that they are to some extent. Well, and I, you know, I have probably had bad experiences because when they're not screened well, that's when we get involved in cases. So Absolutely. So I think we see a lot of those where, you know, of course our clients tell us that there's absolutely He's lying, okay, so. Well, as you know, as, as often happens, it's a race to the courthouse. I may have started a fight with Lynn. He may then beat me up. I may get mad and get to the courthouse first and say Lynn assaulted me. And some county attorneys in this area will not take cross complaints. They will not let us complain against each other and then go to court and have the judge and the prosecutors and the defense attorneys resolve it, which is would make a private citizen think that was inherently unfair, and it is. Uh, but oftentimes, more oftentimes than not, it results in a race to the courthouse, which none of us want. Well, actually all of us want because then, then it's going to get us more clients because the person who's <laughs> mad about it is going to go find an attorney. Right. But there is a bit of inherent unfairness there. I liked your scenario where I got to beat you up. I thought it was going to be <laughs> that I, you know, was hit by, uh, that I hit you and then I ran uh, or something like that. So, I, that so makes you get me, to beat you up. That makes okay. me feel good. Thank you. I've always been scared of you, Lynn. <laughs>
<laughs> and we're going to watch and cheer, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I'm sorry to get us off track. Um, Emily, ha do you um, have uh, any particular crimes that you find uh, are difficult um, as far as the elements, um, uh, things that people can do without realizing that they're doing, and I'm thinking particularly of these harassment type charges that are crimes. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Well, there's two, I guess, harassing type tr uh, crimes. There's harassment itself and there's harassing communications. Um, harassing communications is, uh, you guys correct me if I'm wrong here because I get them a little bit confused, harassing communications is actually a misdemeanor um, and harassment can be a misdemeanor or a violation. Um, harassing communications is kind of like what you think of if you uh, repeatedly make phone calls or write letters uh, that have no uh, legitimate reason for doing so. Uh, if you continue to, uh, if I continue to call you and hang up on you, if I continue to call you and call you a bad word, just no legitimate reason for the phone call. Uh, I think a lot of times uh, people uh, in a lot of custody times, custody disputes, harassing communications will occur and people don't realize they're committing a crime. Um, and then harassment itself um, can be maybe um, continuing uh, to drive by the house or um, continuing to knock on the door and run away or something like that. That type of harassment would just be a violation, but then if um, I pushed you, but there wasn't any physical harm done to you, that would actually be a misdemeanor. Um, and I think that a lot of times those types, uh, just in just family disputes a lot, uh, arise to uh, an actual crime, but people don't realize it. Like I said, you're just involved in family disputes and people just don't realize that they're involved in crimes and then you get the race to the courthouse, people are charged, people wind up in jail or summons to court and uh, then they're furious because the other party wants to charge too because they say they're being harassed um, and, and you wind up um, in a bigger mess maybe than when you started before the courthouse and the court system was involved. A lot of those things happen in a boyfriend-girlfriend situation. I'd say probably 99.9% .9 of the situation is that. And I don't know about you, Lynn, but I probably would have never gotten a date had, not harassed, had I not harassed <laughs> somebody. Uh, but uh, the standard they use, and Emily, correct me if I'm wrong, is it, it's reasonably what is it reasonably intended to annoy someone? Annoy, harass, or alarm. Right. I think. So the, you, you go back to that reasonable man standard, and, and it's, it's a the determination the judge makes. If he puts himself in the reasonable man position and says, "Would this annoy me, harass me, or the other thing that Emily mentioned?" and that's kind of the standard. So. So it, it has to do with okay, you're, you're irritating me. So it's it's my decision. It's it's whether or not I feel like I'm being harassed not whether you feel that you're actually harassing me. Correct, and the judge has to use that standard. I mean, I, I may, you and I may be involved in a romantic situation, and I may, you may have broken up with me, and I may want to desperately get you back. I don't think I'm annoying you. I think I'm just trying to attract you to come back to be my boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. Uh, but that's not the standard it's used. And I'm seriously annoyed, and I'm going to, you know, have you arrested. Julie, I don't doubt that. Yeah, but there, <laughs> al there always has to be uh, proof, and sometimes it, uh, or most times rather, it arises out of the factual situation, uh, and that is proof of intent uh, to commit a crime. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about that uh, that the folks might be a little bit interested in, and we've talked about elements, and I'm not sure that they would really know what elements of crime mean. Uh, it's so common uh, for us well, to talk about. Well, it's kind of like it. the ingredients to a recipe. Right, and I thought I'd give an example, and it's kind of interesting, I thought. Uh, years ago, I uh, practiced law in Louisville, and there was a nightclub in Shively, and uh, so I got assigned the nightclub owner when he was charged with disorderly conduct because he had a, a girl in there dancing. And, uh, I think I've been there. Been there? Anyway. <laughs> uh, had a girl in That's there. Where she got that blouse. Had a girl <laughs> apparently in there dancing, and there was a police officer in Shively that uh, wanted to... Uh, charge somebody at the club with something uh, and so anyway uh, she was uh, the crowd was hollering pretty loud and uh, and she was taking off several parts of her clothing uh, portions of her clothing and uh, so anyway the charge was uh, placed against the nightclub owner for uh, disorderly conduct and against the dancer as well uh, and I think uh, they dismissed against the nightclub owner but anyway I ended up representing the dancer 
and uh, on disorderly conduct, you uh, normally have to have uh, several elements. And when we're talking about elements, it's, it's proof of a particular set of facts. Uh, for instance, on disorderly conduct, you have to have uh, the offense committed in a public place, as I understand it. Uh, and then, in addition to that, you also have to have certain things such as an unreasonable noise or annoyance, that type of thing. Um, and so anyway, when we got into the case, one of the, one of the questions that I asked the police officer was, I said, well, when you entered into this club, you know, what was the atmosphere like? And uh, he said, well, it was kind of loud and raucous. I said, did everyone appear to be enjoying themselves? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And I said, were there any windows from which people who were passerbyers outside could look in? Uh, say if you had a Southern Baptist preacher, could he look in through the window and see what was going on? No, you couldn't look in. So anyway, at the end of the proof, I made a motion uh, for a directed verdict, in other words, to dismiss the charge. And the primary ground for that was that the element of uh, an unreasonable noise or annoyance in a public place was not met, uh, and particularly since everybody was having a grand old time, nobody was annoyed by this. Uh, and uh, also because it was not in a public place as such, it was in a nightclub, uh, the no and the noise didn't emanate to the outside and nobody could see what was going on from the outside, you really didn't have the element of a public place met, and it, the it, judge dismissed it. You're, you're absolutely right, and we all understand that you have to, up to prevail the prosecution has to prove each and every element beyond a reasonable doubt. However, in order to get to that point, um, you've got to usually, about half the time anyway, get arrested, post bond, hire a lawyer, go to court three or four times, and if you, if you can't get a deal you can live with, an offer, okay, you plead guilty and this is what will happen, and you don't feel you're guilty, uh, you have to have a trial, ultimately. So, you know, all of that comes before actually going to trial and risking, and it's a risk, I don't care how righteous you are, it's always a risk at trial, and it costs you a lot of money because somebody got mad at you and decided that you were harassing them, uh, you know, you cussed out a cop. Criminal you know, trespass, meeting on somebody's trespass. property when they don't like it. I've seen people be arrested for AI when they were a passenger and had a designated driver because the car got pulled over. There, I've had people arrested for AI in their house, uh, and they still have to go to court, hire a lawyer, and go through all that. So what we all would like to do is not ever step through that first threshold. Uh, and there are a lot of ways that you can do that. And you were talking about intent, but one of the other things that I see frequently, and I'm sure we all do, is wanton endangerment. People more and more are getting charged with wanton endangerment, and there's a felony and a misdemeanor level of wanton endangerment. I've seen people charged with wanton endangerment for speeding with children in the car. Uh, Andy, can you tell us a little bit why wanton endangerment gets to be a fuzzy area? You know, explain, explain to the audience what wanton endangerment is, because uh, well, they may not all know. Basically, wanton endangerment is when you um, don't intend a result, but maybe a result happens. For instance, uh, firing a gun into a crowded room. Well, maybe nobody got shot, but your action was so wanton that someone could have been injured or hurt sufficiently. The example that I always like to use, and it's happened to one of my clients, is um, a lady had too much to drink before she picked her kids up at school. She had a car wreck on the way home and she was intoxicated. Well, that's kind of the classic definition of wanton endangerment. Her, she didn't intend to try to harm her children, but she drank enough and got behind the wheel of a car with them in it to where that would potentially endanger their lives. So it's wanton activity, it's unintentional activity, where you could put another person at great risk. All right, and uh, uh, I know one of the other things that I see a lot on, on um, and I'm sure, because I know you do an awful lot, of, both of you and Emily, you do a lot of DUI cases. Um, I do a few too. And you do, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I know you do, I know you do, and, and I do too for that matter. Okay, now we got that settled. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, we see, and there is a new law that's fairly recent, uh, where if you flee from an officer while you're 
and then get arrested for DUI and it's proven. Uh, that's an additional crime is running from the officer. And right. I know I hear folks jokingly say they'll never catch me. Uh, well, they will catch you and then you'll get an extra charge. At what? How does that work with the, that fleeing from well, an officer? Fleeing and evading, if, you're, if they can prove that you're also DUI under the influence, uh, actually makes it a felony. So then you, instead of just looking at a DUI, which um, depending on if it's a first or second, would carry um, either little or no jail time, you're then looking at a class D felony, which uh, would carry one to five years in prison. So uh, it becomes a simple DUI case, uh, then becomes the felony case. So basically it aggravates the DUI into a felony case. Uh, and what about if you, if during that chase you pass four people on the street? I think they could possibly charge you with four counts of wanton endangerment. If, and if they could props possibly prove that you put those people at risk. Um, and see, that is an awful, awful law. Uh, I well, can, I you know, it should that. never have been passed because when you have a person that is DUI, you know, and, and I mean, if they're, you know, out of it, you know, they don't realize what they're doing. And, and, you know, how far do you go in penalizing somebody that is an alcoholic, a drunk? Sure, they need to be responsible for their acts when they take the first drink. But just how far do you go? And the law's already there anyway. You know, instead of making it almost an automatic, uh, if the police chase them and they're drunk, you know, they got the other charge, why not use the law that's already in place? And that is that, you know, if they have done something that is so egregious, uh, uh, then, you know, perhaps uh, they're, they're guilty of a separate wanton endangerment. But to have the two linked together, uh, DUI uh, and, and wanton endangerment or a similar charge, it's just, I think it's horrendous. And, and I don't know what well, the legislature's well, thinking about. Well, uh, if, what the legislature should have done, if anything, they should have just increased the penalties uh, for DUI. Right. As you know, as we all know, but the public may not know, wanton endangerment, there's a felony wanton endangerment, there's a misdemeanor wanton endangerment. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, the police and prosecutors come up on a situation where there's nothing specific that they can hang their, their hat on, and they kind of throw it in that catch-all of wanton endangerment, either a, a felony offense or a misdemeanor offense. Um, if you, uh, for instance, if I, um, maybe I'm sitting around uh, drinking, or using drugs, and my one of my uh, neighbor kids comes in, and he's 16 years old. Well, a, a misdemeanor the, the prosecutors may determine is not sufficient enough for me in that situation, so they'll throw a catch-all, wanton endangerment, first de first degree against me for endangering that kid by sharing drugs or drink with him. But as we both know, it's kind of a it's kind of a catch-all crime, like wanton endangerment. I mean, like a disorderly conduct or alcohol intoxication. If the police oftentimes can't find anything else to charge you with, they may charge you with disorderly conduct or alcohol intoxication just to quiet you down or to get you arrested mm -hmm. or to search your vehicle, which we're getting to in a minute. And I'm seeing that wanton endangerment go even a little bit further where uh, I think in your scenario it was actually maybe sharing the drugs, but uh, even if maybe marijuana is being smoked and there's a child in the house, then they're being charged with wanton endangerment just because the child's in the house. So that's something that people probably you know, need to be aware of and realize that that is a, people are being charged with felonies if just marijuana is being smoked in a house. Yeah, that, and I've seen that, that, is, too. that is, uh, uh, And I'll tell you something that the public really needs to be aware of, and, and, and saying this, I, I have a lot, and I emphasize that, a lot of good police officer friends and acquaintances, and I have the ultimate respect for their job. Uh, wouldn't want to do it. it's a tough job but there is a habit of overcharging and we've talked about that on past uh, uh, shows I think uh, and you know if the police officer has any doubt whatsoever about the charge the police officer will uh, put a charge on the person that is the higher charge rather than either an appropriate charge or a lower charge and so we run to court and then the Commonwealth comes in that is the prosecutor and says Oh, well, we'll amend it down. Well, that's getting it down to what it ought to have been okay. in the first place. But in the meantime, the person has a felony, maybe arrest record, uh, and, and a had a bond. felony bond and a higher lawyer's fee because we all know that we charge more for handling felonies than we do for misdemeanors, or at least I do. And so the person gets that penalty 
uh, when, you know, if they had been charged with what was the proper and appropriate charge in the first place, a lot of that could have been avoided. Well, and then judges at sentencing will say, you already got a break because the charge was amended, and I'm not going to give you another break. Plus, O'Reilly on, uh, on Fox <laughs> News will say, oh, my goodness, you know, they're, you know, plea bargaining, how terrible it is. Well, you know, there would be a lot less plea bargaining if the police officers and the prosecutors didn't seek higher charges than what uh, would be otherwise appropriate. That's all i got to say about that, and I hope my police officer friends will understand, but they know the truth. Well, but the prosecutors do. I mean, the prosecutors control the charges ultimately. But Lynn makes a good point. Now, the police officer on the street, he uses a different standard than the jury does in the jury box. He has to have reasonable suspicion of criminal activity. It's not whether or not you did what you're supposed to have done. It's just he's, if he's got reasonable suspicion that you did it, he can arrest you. Well, many people think that may be unfair. Well, he's erring on the side of safety most of the time mm -hmm. when he's out on the street. Now, can that same officer go to the courtroom with that same set of facts and prove you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? Maybe not. And that's where the fairness in the system comes in. Yeah, it's sort of like a fiction has, uh, uh, I'll say this, sneaked into the system. Uh, you know, that, well, since the system is inherently a plea bargain system, then as police officers, we want to get it right, so we charge a little higher, knowing it's going to get amended down a little lower to what it probably should be. And, and I don't know how we got started with all that, but uh, it's developed over the years, and it's become like an octopus, and it's got us all with strangle holes, and nobody knows how to, uh, to modify it and maybe make it a little bit more fair uh, than what it is. Uh, well, it would help if everybody in the system recognized that these are maximum charges and, and set bail and sentencing and, and uh, pretrial issues accordingly rather than just assuming because, you know, we all understand that you're innocent till proven guilty, but that really only applies in a jury trial, in a trial, that that standard comes out. When you're going all through the system before you get to there, I hate to say this, but I really believe that you're guilty until you're, somebody proves you're innocent or until you have a trial. The judges consider, um, uh, they don't consider you innocent when they're setting the bond. They consider, you know, they look at the, the best light on the prosecutor's case. At a preliminary hearing, the judge puts the best light on the prosecutor's case. So really, it's only if you go to trial that you're going to get that benefit of the doubt. Um, well, you also got to have a little bit of play between the police officer and the prosecution. Now, now some, uh, we have a lot of great prosecutors around here, but as, as we know, some prosecutors will charge you with the crime that the police officer charged you with and won't amend it to anything else. His thinking or her thinking may be that that's what they charged you with, I'm not going to amend it, that's what it is, no matter, wh no matter what the facts are. So occasionally there needs to be commit better communication between all sides of the bar, prosecutor, defense attorney, and the police officer. Another issue that, that I'd kind of like to bring up, and I hope I didn't start shifting this to negativism <laughs> uh, and criticism, uh, but I, I wish we could, we could work on this, uh, and that is using policy. Uh, and I'm speaking here primarily of prosecutors. Uh, hopefully judges, uh, well, judges use policy too. There's two things that I'm talking about here. Law, you know, and, and the law is what the person's charged with. And then policy, how we deal with it in addition to what the law says we can do as far as penalties. And I, get, I give you uh, an example of what happened to me this morning, just briefly. I went to court. A person was charged with trafficking uh, in uh, some drugs, meaning they sell, sold or uh, otherwise uh, gave the drugs to somebody else, transferred them, and with a theft charge, both Class D felonies. Person's never been convicted of anything. Person is uh, not as old as me, but getting there person's worked at long-time employment, da-da-da-da-da. Uh, there were a lot of mitigating circumstances, and the policy that was quoted to me was, we don't even talk about amending to misdemeanors and settling these cases like this in the district court if there is a trafficking charge. And we may work it out upstairs, uh, meaning after there's an indictment, if there is, but it, it just doesn't seem right to me that there ought to be some set policy. I think each case ought to stand on its own and ought to be decided on its own at each level. Uh, but that's not the way our system works in the prosecutor's office here. 
and even the judges have policies. Have policies. Well, and I think part of that, and you know, maybe I'm just pulling this out of my hat, but I think part of the reason why elected officials like to have policy uh, is so they will not be perceived uh, as playing favorites uh, because of your, you know, because of your education or where you live or who your parents are or how much money you have. Uh, and it's, it's a safer way politically to do things. And I certainly appreciate that, that that's something that they feel worried about. Uh, and the media, bless them, often pick up, like Bill Riley, will pick up on something that they don't understand uh, and you know, throw the book and harass and have hard headlines about a judge who did, who followed the law and did the right thing, but there was a bad result down the road. And I mean, would you agree that that's primarily the reason for these policies? I would agree. Yeah. And nobody wants to appear soft on crime. No. Right. But so now here's what we got. We got a big announcement here. Lynn must be wanting. He's going to be running for a, a prosecutor's position sometime soon, so he can set the policy. So, but I, I disagree with him in a little bit. Never. The elected, you know, the prosecutors are elected officials. The judges are elected officials. We do have laws, mm -hmm. but they're the ones that set the policies. Now, whether they amend something or don't amend something, whether you have to go to trial or don't have to go to trial, if we don't like them as citizens, we don't like that policy, we can vote them out. I, right. I guess my I don't think the citizens really Sorry. see what's going on though. I guess my question is where do the courts and where do the prosecutors get the authority to have policies? You know, what they have is the authority of the law uh, procedurally as to how to deal with these cases and then uh, regarding sentencing recommendations for the prosecution and sentencing imposition for the courts. Well the prosecutors have the authority because that is what they are and right. it's what they are about. The prosecutor has the ultimate and only authority to bring charges against people. And as long as they do it legally, they can have any policy they want. Or to amend or reduce the yeah. charge. But there is really nothing, there's really nothing, I guess it's to. inherent. Right, they don't. There's really nothing that says prosecutor or court, you have the right to exercise policy. Well, no, but it's, I mean, it doesn't say <coughs> you can't either. Yeah, and I, I know it's I, I know it's for fairness, so they say, but whatever happened to just doing the next right thing on the case before you without putting it into a, a position of policy in categories it it doesn't fit this policy, so we can't do it I, cool. I, you know because the citizens who vote don't yeah. like you to do it right, plus we've all got policies yeah I, my policy is I don't like to plead somebody guilty who's not guilty uh, yeah i I, I really hate it <laughs> that's that the happens. next yeah. right thing yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. They're entitled to have their policies. We're entitled to have their po our policies. Um, maybe never the twain shall meet, but there, as I always tell uh, people who are complaining about a certain prosecutor's policies, hey, he's the guy. If he you is. don't like the guy who makes the policy, get the guy out of office. And but the thing that's most frustrating, I could deal with the fact, okay, we've got a policy here. All right, I understand it. Then I go two counties over. And they got a different policy, okay? So you yeah, really they do. They are I different mean, in every county, yeah. And I think that, that that's kind of frustrating for defendants, too, because uh, whatever defendant you represent in, in whatever county, the policy with that county attorney, with that commonwealth attorney is different. The way that court system works, the way that judge works is different. I mean, you pretty much have to go to that county and practice in that county to understand how it works. Emily, call, let me, can I put Emily on the spot? What does this mean over but, there? But can I, I put Emily have, on the spot? But I do have something to say. In, okay. in, as far as your policy, um, I, I've been practicing six years in McCracken County and pretty much done all criminal law and seen the policies change just a little bit in this this county. But it seems to me, I always get frustrated whenever the policy is saying, but it seems you can always work in the policies and make them work for your clients. You just have to, it just seems to me that however the policies change, you can always work in them and make them work for your client. Like right now, uh, it seems like the policies are pretty tough, but we have drug court. So drug court seems to be another option for our mm -hmm. clients. Unless but your client is charged with trafficking. Yeah. Well. <laughs> There's no doubt you have to be uh, uh, flexible and you have to adjust right. when these it things just, change. It just seems that, that there's always a way to work in the policies and, and they always seem, you seem to get frustrated, but it always seems to find a way to work around them. But Let me, I want okay. to put you on the spot mm -hmm. here. You know, I brought up uh, one or, and I think somebody else brought up another uh, thing that we don't like, uh, or maybe we, 
we have some criticism of. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think, Emily, because I've never asked a, another lawyer this question, what do you think is the very best thing that we have, uh, not necessarily here in McCracken County, but just generally, what is the very best thing that we have in the criminal law? Besides, lawyers. besides the lawyers. right, besides <laughs> lawyers and the right to jury trial, but as far as, as far oh. as just the the local system, uh, whether it be Marshall County, uh, mm. Graves County, McCracken County, you got any, any thoughts on that? Gosh, I, you know, I, I, you think my first thing with McCracken is it's at least consistent. I mean, it's definitive. There's no question about. You know, there being any wiggle room, there isn't any wiggle room. You know exactly in McCracken County what you know how it's going to go down, what the pol what the policy is, and that it's absolutely not going to change no matter what the situation. And that can be a good thing because then, like Emily says, you can work with it and work right. around it. Uh, gosh, I don't know if I have the, the best thing. I'm going to take her off the spot for just All a right. second, Lynn, but you can get back to her if you want to. But she said something just a minute ago that was the essence of what we do. And I, I've been hard on Emily because she's a young lawyer and I, sometimes I think old lawyers are hard on young lawyers just to prove a point and I, I don't prove a point with you because you're a capable lawyer. But when people change their policies, and when we're faced with a policy or a law or something we don't like, it's our job to sit back and to be creative and to try to do our job in a creative manner for our clients that mm -hmm. gets a good result for them. And, and that was a great answer she gave to that last question, and that's that's the key for every defense attorney, I think. Lynn, the right. old ones like mm -hmm. me, young ones like Emily, and me, I'm, and, I'm one of the young ones. No. Yeah, that's our job, <laughs> and, and a lot of people don't understand that. Is we have to represent our client, and when faced with a door somewhere, we got to try to find a window find somewhere it. else. And it's not we don't make up things to get through that window. We just try to make our client's situation benefit the particular policy that the prosecutor is putting down that. Well, day. and the end result is we you know, we're working to get the best possible result for our clients. It may not be, you know, that, that they may have to go to jail. Uh, but they may not have to do as much time as they otherwise would. So yeah, I mean it's the best possible result and you work within the system and within the policy to get that result. Um, and that is the wonderful thing about practice of law, and, and I don't think that the general public can really appreciate it, uh, you know, just like I can't appreciate a lot of things about what they do professionally, but the idea of creativity. You know, uh, if you just did the same thing over and over and over again, it would get awfully tiring. But because the laws change, and the policies, uh, depending on who's and in, the and because who's out, the all clients. Different. You know, it does give us a chance to be creative, and as Emily says, try to make the wor the system work for our clients, and not just for the prosecution. Let One of the know. things I uh, that I thought of Emily, though, before you go on uh, about uh, good things, I think we have pretty good communication uh, in McCracken County, particularly and in the surrounding counties, between the prosecutor offices and defense counsel. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm including locally here the county attorney's office as well as the Commonwealth attorney's office. At least if, if somebody will talk to you and listen to you, even if they don't go with what you want or agree with you, uh, I think that's a, a very helpful thing. And I don't know whether you all find that to be true here or not. I, I agree. And I think that maybe one thing the public doesn't see, especially when they hire attorney, defense attorneys, is a lot of times uh, I think there's a, a good rapport sometimes with the bar, the, all the attorneys in the area, um, because, I mean, you know, we're talking here criticizing a little bit the prosecutor's office and maybe the police, but for the most part, the, the prosecutors and the defense attorneys and the police all like each other and are friends, and so um, that's a good thing for defendants that hire us, and uh, I think sometimes you know, defense attorneys will come in and say to me, maybe about another attorney, oh, he's friends with him or he's friends with her. Or, but I don't think that that clients don't understand that that's good, that we can, everybody can get along and talk and, and communicate because that helps their case, that there's communication. It does. And I like that about McCracken County and sometimes don't see that when I go other places. I mean, uh, one of my, my, my favorite days is like pretrial conferences when you kind of sit there in that side room and all the attorneys have mm -hmm. a chance to talk. I call, I call it happy hour for attorneys and there's no alcohol, but you know, there's just attorneys talking. But you know, that, that helps to have that communication, so. It does, and I think, you know, the, the, the problem that we most have with law enforcement officers 
are the occasional law enforcement officer who has a personal agenda won't talk to you won't tell you what really happened you know it's like because they've got their own agenda and by far most law enforcement officers are doing their job they're doing it to the best of their ability they're telling you the truth they're not trying to hide anything their job is to enforce laws arrest people when they think they're guilty and then and be witnesses so and that's the same way with other lawyers our job is to do the best we can and not to prevaricate with each other let me wait a minute, wait a minute. prevaricate prevaricate yeah <laughs> not to lie to each other thank you okay thank you i, I didn't know you didn't know i that haven't used that word forever so, um, meaning never <laughs> yeah. let's back up just a minute well my husband won't let me call him a liar so oh. you know i have yeah, to think have have to have another word okay um let me back up. You, Andy, you had mentioned in passing uh, police officers and the fact that they come across people and, and they have to have an articulable suspicion that, that there's criminal activity and or probable cause. Um, let's talk for a minute. I know occasionally people cross paths with a police officer and not everybody understands what what they can do, what they what they must do when they come in contact with an officer. And in particular, I, there was a case not long ago in another state regarding whether or not you had to show an ID. You're walking down the street, an officer comes up to you and says, you know, you, you look suspicious to me, let me see your ID. Do you have to show them an ID in the state of Kentucky? Well, of course, with the Bush administration, and you'll never know and what the law is going to be in the future, but the, the police officer generally has to have to be able to articulate some reasonable suspicion of criminal activity. This is not Nazi Germany. They can't they can't come up and ask you for your papers. Uh, they might they might do that. You have, certainly have the the right to say, officer, am I doing anything wrong? And if the officer says no, uh, then you you can make that choice about whether you want to. Uh, come up with your uh, identification papers or not, uh, he may then c may come up with a choice about whether he wants to arrest you for a trumped up charge, disorderly conduct, AI, or, or something like that. But generally, unless the police officer can articulate some kind of reasonable suspicion of criminal activity, which is the old Terry stop situation, uh, Terry versus Ohio that we all learned about in law school. Did I get that right, Terry versus Ohio? I think I did. Um, they've got to have some reason for checking your papers again. It's not Nazi Germany. You've got to make a tough decision about whether you want to cooperate or not. You know, if you're not doing anything, you might want to. If you if you want to try to make a point that you know the law of the officer, he may try to make a point to you and, and uh, prove that he knows it too, and he's got he's got the gun and the badge and the power to arrest you. Well, I'm happy to say there are still some good citizens um, in this country who take personal offense uh, it being you know what they might consider harassed and uh, and on principle you know, they will not allow, um, you know, law enforcement or anybody to overstep, you know, what they feel is their constitutional right. Um, another thing that comes up other than just being stopped on the street is uh, I've had people call, and I'm sure you have and we all have, uh, and say, you know, Detective so-and-so called and wanted me to come down to the station and talk, he wanted to talk to me about some embezzlement at my work. You know, should I go? Emily, should he go? You don't have to go. I mean, okay. That's up to you. Uh, it it all depends on what you did or didn't do, and and what you so have. So if I'm not guilty, I should go. Not necessarily. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know, at that point, uh, my advice to you would be to contact an attorney. Uh, it will tell you not to go. <laughs> <laughs> depends. It all depends. Some, and if you contact an attorney. They can go with you. Right. And that right. attorney can stop the interrogation whenever they want to, unless the person's under arrest. And right. So can you get in trouble for just saying, I'm sorry, I, I decline? You shouldn't get in trouble, but of course you could be charged with a crime if they do have evidence against you. But then if you interview, they're going to probably charge you anyway. Right. And you should know, too, that if you do give an interview and you are charged with a crime, that those statements that you make can be used against you if you are tried. What if they didn't read the me my rights? That's the biggest question we get every time, and I know Emily and Lynn, you get the same thing. But they didn't read me my rights. Yeah. Well, unless you've been charged with unless yeah. you've been charged with a crime, and unless they intend to interrogate you further, they don't have to read you your rights. If they say, oh, "Carolyn, come on now, let's have a chat," uh, and you and that, they may even tell you you're the target of the investigation, but they don't have to read you your Miranda rights till you're arrested. The Supreme Court of the United States might as well just throw the Miranda rights right out the window. They don't mean a darn thing anymore. Uh, 
and Miranda, you, for, you, sorry, you and never, Miranda is the case that established the fact that a person must understand that they have certain rights. Yeah, and I named my cat after Miranda v. Arizona, the case. Her name's Miranda. <laughs> but it just, I tell you what, there's just, there's just nothing there anymore because, you know, people don't know when they're supposed to have their rights read and when they aren't. When they're you know, under, you can have, tell you can, us two things. Well, let me give you an example. You're out and you stopped on the side of the road for DUI. The police officer comes up and he hasn't placed you under arrest. And so he starts asking you 59 questions. The first question is, you know, well, how much have you had to drink? You know, where'd you have it? You know, and uh, when'd you have your last drink? And da 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 da. You know, and if you, you know, and you feel put upon because he's got you there, he doesn't turn around and say, oh, by the way, Mr. Ogden, you're free to leave. You know, he makes you feel like that you're not free to leave, and I bet you he would stop you if you tried to, but the way the Supreme Court has come down on Miranda, every answer that you give is admissible regardless of whether he gave you the rights or not. The only time at that point uh, in the whole process that Miranda kicks in and he has to read the rights in, able, in order to get everything in that you say is after he handcuffs you and arrests you. Well, it's, it's, it's a two-prong. You must be under arrest and you must be, be under questioning. Um, and under arrest, the, the, the rule for that is if a reasonable person would not feel free to leave. Yeah, but I so tell you the, what the, the courts are going to say. The courts are going to say, while you were standing there on the side of the road and he was asking you all these questions right. that were incriminating, you were free to leave. So that's why we're going to tell everybody that they should say, may I leave your, you know, leave now, your, you know, officer. Uh, or just say, I don't want to talk. So why, why in the world would the Supreme Court make a fiction out of that and say, oh, the person's free to leave? even though they're standing there with a Kentucky State Trooper looking at I don't know why them. they did that, Liz. Sandra Day O'Connor just retired when you call her and ask her. But the, the, the big kicker is this, though. Most people that call, and I get a lot of calls, Emily gets a lot of calls, we all get a lot of calls, um, they'll say, well, it didn't read me my rights, me my shouldn't rights. they throw my case out? Well, the big answer to that is, Miranda rights are only read to you so you won't make a statement to incriminate yourself unknowingly. Unknowingly. Okay. They're not going to throw, even if you, under best case scenario, you have a Miranda violation, they're not going to throw out your case. They're only going to throw out your statement in relation to the interrogation. Mm -hmm. You know, the dead body of the smoking gun, that's still evidence. The only thing it didn't evidence after a Miranda violation is your statement. So no, your case is not going to go away just because there's a Miranda yeah, violation. In a lot of instances, uh, or no, I wouldn't say a lot, but in, in numerous instances where I have people say, well, he didn't, the police officer didn't read me my rights. I said, well, did you give any statement, uh, answer any questions? No. no. Yeah. Well, see, Miranda doesn't come into play even at no. that point because, you know, it's only a, a so-called protection uh, if you have made a statement against your interests or what we commonly call an incriminating statement. Uh, I well, think it, I think ahead. it's oh, sorry. I think it's been made to be a big deal on TV shows, yeah. and so everyone's heard Miranda, Miranda, Miranda. So it's the first question they ask their lawyer, and they want us to tell them it's going to be the key to their case. But it's very. I, I would like to, to go to back, if I could, for just a moment to what you talked about uh, concerning going down to the police station or going to the police station, not necessarily down, but when a, an officer calls and says, "I'd like to speak with you," there's one rule to remember, and that is. Do not ever go without a good criminal defense lawyer, period. You know, and don't call up some, you know, shoddy you know, lawyer that doesn't know what he's doing that's going to go down and help the police interrogate you. I've seen that happen. I, I've seen a situation where the, the defense lawyer served coffee to the police officers and helped them ask questions of his own client for some crazy reason. I guess he thought that they would appreciate it and go easier on his client. Uh, so you get yourself a good lawyer, and there's a number of reasons for that. One is, as you were saying, the lawyer, it may be in your interest to give a statement, but they may get beyond the scope of what they should be asking at the police station, and the lawyer can stop the questioning, whereas it's a lot harder for the individual to know when to stop and, and when to start. The other thing is that they'll many times talk to a person, and that, when I'm saying they, I'm talking about the police, they'll talk to a person, then they'll want a second interview. And the reason they want the second interview is that they want to ask them the same questions again, and we're all human, and we're going to give a little bit different answers. And so then they say, oh, you're not telling the truth. And I had that happen on a burglary case, and I stopped the questioning. Well, I, you know, I have even, and officers usually will cooperate, especially when I, I had a case where there was a, a stolen gun that kept making the rounds, and they were trying to, officers were trying to trace it back, and my client was one of the, 
in the middle somewhere with the gun. Uh, and the officer really was trying to find out the original person uh, and didn't have any problem. I had my client uh, come to my office, make a written statement under my direction so that I understood what he was putting in it, sent the written statement to the officer. My client named where he got it, you know, who he sold it to, where he got it from, um, and, and nobody ever bothered us again. So a lot of times officers are looking not for your client, really not for your client, they're looking for evidence against someone else that's a target of their investigation. Uh, which brings me to, a, to another uh, uh, crime that's a federal crime that uh, recently, I was I had a client that was charged with counterfeiting, and and but he was like photocopying paper. I mean, it was like silly, uh, and the feds really weren't that interested in him. So I was looking for a another crime. For those of you who don't understand, lawyers negotiate a lot of times just for time. All right. Uh, the prosecutor wants to give them seven years, you want them to have four years, they want four years, uh, and sometimes in order to get that lesser amount of time, you've got to find another crime, a lesser crime to, for them to be charged with. So I'm looking through the federal uh, titles for another crime, and I run across a crime I'm ashamed to say did not know existed, uh, called misprison of a felony. It's not a state crime, it's only a, a federal crime. Uh, well, any of you, can any of you explain what this silly crime, crime is? It's not well, real silly, I, it's dangerous. I looked it up in Black's Law Dictionary before I came out today because on the email you sent me, you said you were going to talk about it. And uh, <laughs> so I want to okay, know what we were going to talk be able about. To answer this question. Well, I can't remember the definition exactly, but it, it uh, generally is concealing uh, the fact that a person, another person, has committed a crime. Uh, that's well, the in particular, thing. it's an affirmative duty to tell a federal officer if you know a felony is being committed. And Black's Law Dictionary also says that it's uh, it's not used uh, very often anymore. Well, okay. so the uh -huh, but I've had one. Yeah. And, I have and here was the fact scenario. The situation was a, a young lady was not married to someone, but she was living with someone. She lived with this certain someone for a long period of time. The person never had a job. He uh, was in and out all the times of day or night. Uh, he kept her in a pretty good lifestyle that she was uh, became accustomed to. Mm -hmm. uh, so he had a lot of income uh, that she didn't know where it was. She didn't know where it was necessarily coming from, uh, but she might have known. Uh, she didn't actually know. She didn't actually see a drug transaction or him buying or selling drugs from anybody. But lo and behold, the police come in one night and raid this raid the place, and they find a big rock of crack in a cereal box. Okay, that she gets charged with trafficking in crack. He gets charged with trafficking in crack. Uh, but she says, I didn't know anything about it. She made a statement to the prosecutor, with me with her, of course, where she detailed all these things that she n knew and didn't know. And because of that, uh, the prosecutor agreed to let her plead to what's called a misprison of a, of a felony, which is, you didn't actually know that someone was committing a felony, but she had probably a pretty good idea. They could prove, you probably had a pretty good idea that mm -hmm. they know what, he kn she knew what he was doing. Uh, and she didn't report it to the police. So in the federal system, yeah, there is a there is a difference. You have an affirmative duty to report something you think might be a felony. And that was a really smart thing that you did because uh, there are not very many misdemeanors that would be at all possibly relevant or applicable uh, that you could take a felony charge and amend down to. And that's and, a good and one. And that's, that's, the only one, that's one that exists. Right. I mean, you yeah. know, now in Kentucky, we've got all kinds of different mm -hmm. misdemeanors, yeah. but not in the federal system. Uh, the other thing is, is that there is a uh, related offense that a lot of people don't know about uh, who aren't lawyers, and that is 18 United States Code Section 1001, false statement to a federal agent. Yeah. Uh, and if Does it have to be sworn to to be? No. If that person that, that Andy was talking about uh, had been interviewed by a federal agent and gotten scared and said, you know, I don't know anything about this. You know, there, you know I've not seen anything that would indicate to me uh, that this person is committing a felony. That could be a false statement and it's a felony offense. Uh, and because apparently from the scenario of facts you gave, the person did know something. Now it has to be somewhat material, in other words, significant. It can't be a false statement that's, you know, like uh, something happened. Something happened at 12:01 when it really happened at 12 o'clock. 
but that is a very dangerous sentence. That's the Martha Stewart case. Uh, that's what happened with her. But let, me her throw a little, lot of let me throw you a little curveball, though, Lynn. Uh, say you're up at LBL and you're on federal property and you've had a couple of adult beverages and the federal uh, game yeah. warden or whatever he is comes by and he pulls you over and blue lights you and he comes up to your car and says, uh, Mr. Ogden, uh, have you had anything drink alcoholic tonight? And you say no. Have you just committed a crime? A federal felony? Probably. Am I wrong on that? No, you're right. I've seen I it charged so. in federal. Definitely. I've seen it yeah, charged. You don't, you don't mm -hmm. see it charged too often, but probably. Well, how could you? I've seen it? it charged, and believe it or not, um, uh, common sense actually uh, prevailed? prevailed in the U.S. Attorney's Office here in Paducah, and, and they did not go they forward are good with to the work charge. With. But there, yeah. you yeah. jumped. Yeah. You yeah. jumped a misdemeanor up to a felony. Right. Correct. Mm -hmm. Just because well, you. What, what should you have done? Not said a not word. Said <laughs> not said anything. Or said, said the truth. Either say the truth or, you know, nothing. or, or nothing quiet. at all. Probably but keep quiet. Well, and that's, you, you know, that's drinking. a similar, I mean, would you get in that much trouble uh, if your, our local uh, constabulary stopped you on a DUI in downtown Paducah and said, have you been drinking, Ms. Rourke? Well, if you lie to a local officer, it would not be a federal crime. There is no similar state federal felony That's that right. I'm aware of. Yeah, but I always, right. I always thought the best answer was, uh, you know, Officer, I appreciate your inquiring about my uh, mental state, but I can assure you that uh, I am not under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Well, let me give you the right answer. Somebody told me this the other day, and I love it. I'll try to do better next time. <laughs> And that, that's guaranteed to get you a free night in <laughs> Well, we're, we're getting a little bit short on time, but there is one more thing, and we're edging on it, that I was really curious about talking to you folks. Uh, uh, and that is, I see a lot of cases where people get pulled over for DUI or a speeding ticket. Uh, and lo and behold, here come the drug dogs. Uh, how does that play out? I mean, can you refuse, if you're not under arrest, can you refuse to stay by your car while they bring out drug dogs to sniff out your car? Refuse, what do you mean refuse well, to Well, I mean, can you just, I mean, can you say, I don't want to stay here, you're all, you know, I'm not under arrest, I don't want to stay here and wait for the drug dogs. You can refuse, but I don't think, I mean, I think they're going to bring the drug dogs whether you want them there or not. Are you talking about getting in your car and driving off while they're getting the well, drug I'm dogs? Well, I'm talking about just because they, see, they usually, you know this, they always say, if you don't mind, or, you know, it's like with your house, we'd like to come, we need to come in and talk to you, we need you to wait here for a few minutes. Or refuse to agree to the, yeah. the drug dogs to sniff your car. I think you can refuse, but I think that the drug They're dogs gonna are going to do it anyway. anyway. I don't think that they have to have, at least at this point, reasonable suspicion to bring the drug dogs. The car, if the car is located on the side of the road, it's in a public place, and the police officers, so the issue is where the police officers have the right to be where they are, and they do in that instance. Uh, and uh, also, uh, there, you know, there is a practicality. They're not going to let you just drive off. Right, and then you're and, of course, and are you going to second, arrest? You know, and the second thing, they're probably going to, to uh, cite you for disobeying an order of a police officer. You'll force them to arrest you if that happens. Okay. So, so here's you. the bottom line. If you're going to commit a crime, don't do it in your car. You have far less search and seizure <laughs> rights in your car than you do in your home. You, ha you don't have this and much we're not, privacy. Correct. We're not encouraging people to commit crimes, but certainly don't commit one in your car where you have less expectation of privacy than you would in your home. Because cars are just different, and we're out of time. And I've enjoyed it. Okay. You Everybody enjoy enjoyed themselves. Mm -hmm. We hope you enjoyed it too, and we hope you learned something. Um, good evening, and thank you for joining us.